Hello everyone. As many of you know, I recently started making YouTube films and one of the uh, things that's come out of that is that people have been reaching out all over the place asking questions about a variety of things. So instead of answering questions for one person, I figured I would take those person, that person's questions and answer them for everyone in case someone else had the same question. And these questions have been pretty diverse. They've been all over the place. But before I go any further, I just want to say I would never classify myself as a great photographer. I think a label like that comes from other people, not from the photographer. So if someone else would label me as a great photographer, that's one thing. I would never say that about myself. I don't think I've ever been a great photographer and I probably never will. I think every generation worldwide, there's a handful of people that bring something totally new to the table and everyone else is derivative. I think everything I've ever done has been derivative of someone else that came along before me and in most cases did what I did better than I did. My opinion in these answering these questions is just my opinion after being around the professional photography industry for 30 years basically. So take it for what it's worth. So I have a laptop with notes and the questions. These all came from the same person named Kurt and there's four or five questions here. I think they're all pretty valid, pretty interesting and so I just want to jump right in. The first question is, how can you be original when pretty much everything has been done before? Well, making original content is the single most difficult thing you can do as a photographer. It is incredibly difficult. It took me about 10 years of working full time every single day as a professional photographer before I even had a remote idea who I was. And this is after four years of being in photography school. So I was 14 years in before I really woke up one day and said, oh, I think I know who I am and I think I know what I want to do. That's not preposterous. I think it takes a lot of people a long time. It might have taken me a little longer than normal. There's a huge difference between photography and content. The vast majority of what you see in the photography world, including the professional space, is content. And content is work that passes your eyes but never connects with your brain. This is a lot of what you see on Instagram. It's a lot of what you see in advertising and commercial photography and even in editorial now. There's so much formulaic work being done. Photography, on the other hand, are those rare images that cross your eyes and get seared into your brain and are impossible to forget. Photography is incredibly difficult. It's incredibly rare. It's incredibly time consuming and typically very expensive to produce, which is another reason why you don't see a whole heck of a lot of it. Creating original work is is the singular mission of every single good photographer I know. And some of us get there and some of us don't. I wouldn't necessarily throw myself in the category of someone who's actually figured out how to do that, but um, I've enjoyed myself along the way. All right, what else do we have here? Question number two, how can I make an image that people will not say looks like someone else? For example, if I make a documentary street image, people are saying you're copying Cartier-Bresson or Robert Frank. If I make a long exposure, people say I'm copying Michael Kenna. My response is, who cares? And secondly, who is people? So if that means the online photography world, I would ignore it. I don't think the internet is the place you go for photo feedback. I think uh, there's nothing wrong with making a picture that looks like someone else's, but photography is about context and process. It's about understanding the history, what's been done before, who's done it. And then if your work is in that same tradition, you've got to add to the conversation but you have to know what the conversation is before you can add to it. One thing I've noticed over the you know, last 10 years, 15 years, is younger photographers have an aversion to studying the history of what's been done before. People want to think that they're, they're making original work when in fact, I look at a lot of bodies of work, photographer will put it down in front of me and say, look, I just did this, I just, and I'll say, oh, this looks like so-and-so, and they'll say, I don't know who that person is. So it doesn't really matter if your work looks derivative. Mine, my, someone in, when I was in college said, your work reminds me of Antony Kratokville. And Kratokville to me was somebody that I had put on a pedestal in terms of his work. And there were, my, I had two responses to that. One was I was mortified that people might think that I was copying him. But two, I also respected him as a photographer and I thought, well, maybe that's a good thing. Maybe it's good my work looks like him and his work, but I need to make it my own. And so it was a nice little sort of sounding board that I could base things off of. So I wouldn't necessarily look at the online photography community as a good sounding board for your work. What I would do is I would look for a mentor. And this can be done in person or it can be done electronically. Find someone who has a real history in photography, a real career that's been around for a while and say, look, I'm trying to improve as a photographer and I would really love to be able to show you work and you know, work with you as a mentor. You're probably gonna have to pay this person, which is totally legit and totally fine. Uh, I certainly have three or four mentors that I show work to. I would call them in, informal mentorships because we're friends, but I can put a body of work in front of them and we're good, what I'm missing, what I need, and I can, I can trust their opinion 100%. Moving on, question number three. Is there anything you regret doing or not doing throughout your photography career? Jeez, that is a good question. Uh, I have a lot of regrets. 
a lot. However, most of them revolve around things like not working hard enough, not trying hard enough, not failing enough. I think sometimes, you know, we let the industry sort of dictate what we do. And I don't think a lot of people realize how difficult it is to work full time as a photographer, how bad you have to want it, especially if you're one of these people driven by doing your own work as opposed to doing the work that the client's telling you to do. I was fortunate. For whatever reason, I never got the insecurity gene and I never got the gene that felt like it was mandatory to get published. Even when I worked for a newspaper where competition among the photographers was really high. Every day you were under pressure, under deadlines, and there were other people shooting the same assignments as you and you had to perform. I was never thrilled by the idea that the images were going to be published. I didn't really care. To me, it was about the adventure of making the actual photos, the adventure of being in the field and making them, that's where it peaked for me. Regret things that I have done? Not really, not really. I've had to do some sort of sketchy assignments where I had to photograph things or people that I knew I was sort of right on the borderline of whether this was ethical or not. Um, but most of the time I had the, the strength and the luck to be able to say this is not something I'm gonna photograph and was able to work with the assignment editor to find a way around that. Let's go on to the next question. How do you be a reportage or documentary photographer when you have a family? Uh, well, I'm fortunate. I don't really have a family. I just have a wife and my wife is really happy when I leave. So it's easy for me. I tell her what story I want to work on and she's like, go, go get out of here. But other people, it's much more of a balance. So there's a big difference between a reportage photographer in my mind and a documentary photographer. Reportage people or news photographers tend to have a time element and a deadline. And oftentimes they're photographing things like spot news or conflict. Uh, that's a tricky scenario. Documentary photographers will oftentimes take their families with them if they're somewhere for an extended period of time or they'll make trips out to see the family to try to keep a balance. The tricky parts to me are the people who are war photographers or conflict photographers. And each one of those people has a specific scenario worked out. Um, there's a book that came out a couple of years ago by a photographer named Lindsay Adario, which would be an interesting book to read if this is a question that's interesting to you. She is a conflict photographer and has been for quite some time. And she wrote a book about what it's like to be a woman. And also she was pregnant during the time where she was doing some of these assignments. And I believe that that book's being turned into a film right now, which will probably be pretty good. That's a really interesting book. I read that. That'll give you a good idea of what it's like to try to find a balance. I've seen it work really well for people. And I've seen other people, you know, basically they have their family implode because they couldn't find a balance. But when you're super driven to make pictures, we all know we can be hard to be around. Let's see here. This is an interesting question. Is having a signature important? I posted a few images on the internet and asked people what they thought of the project I was working on. Someone commented, he wasn't really keen on the images, but he could recognize my signature in all of them. I didn't realize I had a signature, nor uh, tried to imply that I had one. Now, at first I thought, does he mean literally a signature like on the back of the print? Which is not what he means, but it got me thinking. My signature and my handwriting are so bad that I refuse to sign my prints on the front. What I do is I sign on the back and then I frame my signature into the back of the print so that it doesn't distract from the actual image on the front. If I had great handwriting, I might sign on the front, but I don't, I sign on the back. So having a signature goes back to the original question, making unique content. That is the single most important thing we can do and it is what every great photographer is after. And there's something so cool about being, walk into a gallery or see something in a publication and, and say immediately, I know who did that, I, I know who shot that. That's what we're all after. But the, again, that's incredibly difficult to do. I think every generation, there's a handful of people who are able to pull this off and everyone else is derivative. So yes, having a signature is important. You may or may not know that you have one, but we're all after that. There are people out there, obviously, we all have our favorites, but people whose work you can look at and say immediately, I know who did that. That's the key. Uh, what else do I have here? Little notes for this. Next question. Ernst Haas once said, quote, you have to learn to walk in snow without leaving footprints, unquote. What do you think he means by that? Who's Ernst Haas? Just kidding. So I think what he means by that is something that I've felt for a long time. And when I bring this up with people, they sometimes think I'm being a little bit woo woo. And I do live in New Mexico, so maybe I am being woo woo. But I've always felt that as a good documentary photographer, you can make yourself invisible. And I say that for a couple of reasons. Uh, I've done plenty of projects in the past where I've done the edit and then taken the work back to the people that I photographed. And there were images where I was right on top of them making pictures. And then when they see the prints from the project, they say, I had no idea you were even there. And another friend said to me after working together on a project for a couple of years, she said, you know, you don't take up any physical space. And now on one hand, you could say, well, that's kind of an insult. 
but I took it as a compliment, meaning that when I'm somewhere and I'm working, I'm sort of retracting the energy that my body is putting out and I'm fitting in with the energy that's around me. And I really think this is a real thing. No, you're not completely invisible, but if you're, if you're in tune enough to the dynamic of the energy around you, you can fit in and it reduces your footprint and allows you to work more clearly, more intimately, intimately without intruding on the space of the people around you. And the more you do documentary photography, the quicker you are to realize the energy of a situation. And people always say, how do you know if you can photograph? Or, or do you ask people before? Most of the time I try not to ask because it will completely change the dynamic of where you are. But I will be able to tell immediately whether or not I am welcome and what the repercussions are gonna be if I start to make pictures. And there are times where I get into a scenario and I go, I'm not shooting here because I'm either gonna get my ass kicked or something else bad is gonna happen. And then it takes me a little more time to work in. And other times you get out and all you have to do is make a gesture towards the camera and people are like, no problem, go for it. All right, last question. Who are your idols and mentors in photography? And are there any quotes that inspire you? Hmm, well, I'm gonna answer this in a different way. So. In terms of idols and mentors, yes, but my idols and mentors come from not just photography. A lot of them are from the literature world. I read between 50 and 80 books a year. Most of my story ideas come from literature. They don't come from the photography world. I also get inspired by a lot of people who work in the natural environment. Um, I'm a huge nature person. I grew up in the, in the wild, so that's very influential to me. In terms of mentors photographically, W. Gene Smith, Sebastian Salgado, Georgia Fiorio, and then a couple of people you may or may not have heard of. There's a photographer in Miami named uh, Maggie Stieber. And when I was a freshman at the University of Texas, I transferred in as a transfer student. And Maggie Stieber, who's a photojournalist, was guest teaching a class. And they kind of, the school like on the spot made up this rule that a transfer student couldn't take the class. Just, and I could tell because I was standing in front of them when I said, oh, I'm taking that class. And they go, mm, no, we're not going to let you take that because you're, um, you're a transfer student. And that really chapped my ass. And that lit a fire under me to go out and try to prove them wrong, which I think I did. I don't know. It was kind of foolish. But anyway, Maggie Stieber was a photojournalist, did a book called Dancing on Fire about Haiti back in the 80s. Unbelievable book. I interviewed her on my site, shifter.media. If you want to listen to that interview, it's under the section called Dispatches. She's been a sort of someone that I've followed for a long time. We're not exactly close. We're not, we don't hang out a lot. I don't talk to Maggie very much, but um, I do consider her a acquaintance slash friend, but she was uh, in very influential for me. And the other hero and mentor is going to be a little bit surprising. There's a young photographer who's working right now named Elliot Ross, who's based in Colorado. And Elliot's probably in his late 20s, I'm guessing. And the reason I'm bringing him up is I think he's figured out a way to be a photographer in the modern world and make his own work. So Elliot recently did a project called American Backyard where he drove all 2,200 miles of the US-Mexico border. And that was published editorially and he also just published that in book form. The book's called American Backyard, it's beautiful. And what I like about him again is going back to the fact that he's working in the modern era. He's young, he's starting out, but he's figured out a way to make his work. He's doing commercial work, editorial work, et cetera, some advertising. That's not easy. There's a lot of people sitting around who are being told what to do and they're totally happy by saying, okay, what am I supposed to do and how am I supposed to shoot this and what are you gonna pay me kind of thing. But I like people who are pioneering and the people that give me hope and faith that there is gonna be a few, uh, an industry in the future. To wrap things up, that's the first Q&A. If you have any questions, you can write them in the, uh, in the post below and I will try to address them on the next Q&A and I appreciate you turning in turning in, tuning in, whatever. Thanks again.